Now this slide shows you uh, a crystalline material and an amorphous material. So can somebody define for me what a crystalline material is? How do you define a crystal? How do you know whether this is a crystal or not? That's the key word. So the atoms are arranged in a repeating manner so that you know that if you find a particular atom at this point, you'll also find it at this point, this point, and this point. So we have long-range order inside the crystal. And this is one example where we have uh, green atoms and red atoms. If I know that there's a green atom here, there must necessarily be another green atom here, and you carry on for a very long distance. Okay? So they're defined by the long-range periodicity of the atoms uh, in the structure. Uh, amorphous material, it, the atoms are arranged more or less at random. Okay, so there may be short-range order. That means you know, one of these red atoms is surrounded by three blue atoms, but you cannot uh, predict where the next atom is going to lie or what kind of atom there will be. Can you give me an example of an amorphous material? Glass. Uh, so, um, what kind of glass? Sorry? Hmm? I can't hear you. Uh, SiO2. SiO2, silica glass. Uh, give me two more examples of glass. Um, quartz is silica. Uh, so. Uh, actually, quartz, uh, quartz can be crystalline or amorphous, the amorphous form, yeah? But two other material kinds. Uh, yes, polymers can be glassy, uh, you know, if they're below the glass transition temperature. And? Ceramics, Ceramics can be glassy, so give me one more. Uh, no, gas is not a, a glass, yeah. It's not solid. Metals, hmm? yeah. So you you can you can get metallic glass as well, right? Uh, you simply need to cool fast enough so that there is no crystallization of the liquid. And some people say that uh, metallic glass is liquid metal, but it's it's frozen, right? That isn't uh, actually correct, because a liquid is able to relax at all temperatures. So as you cool it down, you know its density changes and other properties change. Uh, whereas a glass is actually frozen into that state. So its properties change in a different way as you cool the temperature. It does, the structure does not relax. So the difference between a crystal and an amorphous material is uh, defined by the extent of order in the arrangement of atoms, long-range order. Okay? But liquids can also be crystals. Can you give me an example of a product that you use every day which has liquid crystals in it? Hmm? Uh, yeah, liquid crystal displays. Yeah? So ba basically, you know, uh, the definition of a liquid is that it can't support a shear stress. Okay? That means it, can, it flows. Uh, so this is a liquid with uh, you know, elongated molecules and the molecules can slide past each other, therefore it's a liquid. But you can clearly see that there is some sort of order in this. Okay? Therefore, it's not a, a random arrangement of molecules. It's actually a liquid crystalline material. Um, there are different kinds of liquid crystalline material that you can get. Uh, and it's the alignment of those molecules which helps you to make displays because you pass light through it through an analyzer and a polarizer. And the analyzer and polarizer are crossed so no light goes through that. When you apply an electrical field, the molecules align along one of those uh, grids and therefore allows light to go through. Okay? So liquid crystalline displays 
uh, exploit the fact that it's a liquid so the molecules can easily swing around if you apply an appropriate field. Okay. Uh, whereas, of course, in uh, solids, they can't do that. Uh, if you press the screen of your computer, you know, you'll be able to see that the colors almost flow, and that's because there's liquid in there. Right. Uh, this is a, a very beautiful picture and what most people would recognize as crystals. Yeah, if you ask the person in the street to comment on what is this, they would immediately think it is a crystal. And some people even say that crystals have magical properties of some sort. Yeah? But you know, we are not at the moment going to cover that. Uh, the main point is that crystals are recognized by the fact that they have a beautiful shape. They may also have color and so forth. Uh, but we are interested in a more general form of crystal. So, for example, this is a single crystal, right? Do you recognize what this is? It's a, it's a turbine blade for an aircraft engine uh, to work in the very high temperature region of the aircraft engine. And this part of it is a single crystal. It's made out of a nickel alloy. And what you do is you start solidification from here, and you are solidifying in a temperature gradient. So you get lots of crystals growing in this direction. And the one that is growing fastest fills up this spiral and blocks all the others. And therefore, the rest of it solidifies as a single crystal. Why do we need a single crystal? for something that's operating at a very high temperature, something like 1400 degrees centigrade, and rotating extremely fast. Why do we need that? Sorry, louder, please. Uh, heat expansion will happen whether it's a single crystal or, or a polycrystal. Creep, why does, uh, why does using a single crystal reduce creep? Yeah. So uh, grain boundaries accelerate creep deformation. Why is that? What's wrong with grain? That's right. So the diffusion coefficient inside a boundary is higher than inside the volume of the material because the crystals don't match very well at interfaces. Okay? And you also pointed out that there could be some grain boundary sliding. So. At high temperatures, grain boundaries weaken the material, but at low temperatures, they strengthen the material because they provide obstacles to the propagation of slip between crystals. So here, the crystal shape uh, is, uh, is an engineering shape. It, it's got an, th uh, an aerodynamic shape which provides thrust for the engine. Nothing to do with its internal crystalline symmetry. But you will see that the fact that this is a single crystal makes it anisotropic. That means its properties are different in different directions. You know, you can see that very easily even if you look at the schematic diagram here, that the properties in this direction must be different from the properties in this direction because the spacing is different, the neighborhoods are different, and so on. And in the turbine blade, you actually grow the blade along a specific direction so that the elastic modulus is such that you reduce vibrations. Yeah, you, you want as few vibrations inside an aircraft engine as possible. So you can exploit not only the fact that you don't have grain boundaries, but also that you can uh, grow along directions which will minimize vibrations during the operation of the engine. So typically, this might be rotating at 25,000 revolutions per minute inside an aircraft engine. So that's very, if you have vibrations, that's not a good thing. So this, is, this illustrates uh, how the properties vary as a function of direction in a single crystal. So this, ba this surface, a vector from the center to this surface, represents the modulus. And a single crystal of silver, you can see that the modulus is not uh, constant. It varies as a function of directions. There will be certain soft directions 
which, uh, you know, if you stress along soft directions, then the amplitude of vibrations will be large. If you stretch along a, a stiff direction, then the amplitude will be small. Okay? And this is in the case of a body-centered cubic uh, metal, molybdenum, uh, where again you see that the modulus is not identical. It's only when we put polycrystals uh, together in random orientations that we can obtain uh, isotropic properties. But there is no metal or, or crystal in which you can get isotropic properties by a single crystal. Okay, so the vast majority of engineering materials that we deal with are not single crystals, they are polycrystals. Here is a, a typical example of an optical micrograph which shows hundreds of crystals which are packed together in such a way that you fill the space. So there, there are no holes in this material. When, you, when the crystals grow, they're growing from different points, they will touch and therefore they will fill all the space. And these are the boundaries between the crystals, the uh, so-called grain boundary. So another, another name for a crystal is a grain, you know, because it's like a grain of salt. Yeah? In fact, a, a, a grain of salt might itself be a single crystal. So we have these crystals and in between them we have some grain boundaries. And crystallography is not just about single crystals. Uh, we, we need to look at how crystals of different kinds, when we put them together, they behave. Okay? So we will have grain boundaries and the grain boundaries will not be identical. You know, this boundary here, which is between this crystal and this crystal, will be different from this boundary here. And you can see that there are some special boundaries as well. So that actually is a, a, an annealing twin. And you can see that the shape of that boundary tends to be nice and straight because there are low energy interfaces which are uh, much more, much better fit between the two crystals than a boundary of this sort. Okay. So there's a lot of complexity in this. And uh, we can engineer that complexity to get the best properties. And the properties need not be mechanical, you know, they can be electrical properties, for example, uh, or magnetic properties, and so on. Yeah, so can you give me an example of a material where we control the grain structure in order to obtain the best uh, magnetic properties? Yeah? Silicon steel in order to get uh, uh, least resistance to the movement of domains magnetic domains. These pictures are now very common. Uh, the micrograph that I showed you first gives you the shape of the crystals and the size of the crystals, but it doesn't tell you anything about the orientation of the crystal. Um, here the colors represent different crystal orientations. So now you not only have the shape of the crystal, the size of the crystal, but also its crystallographic orientation. And this technique you can use on a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope because you get diffraction information from all of the individual crystals, collect all that and produce a map like this. And you should realize that this is a very nice looking map, but there is a huge amount of information locked away in that. When you do an EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction experiment, you are collecting a vast amount of data. And in 99% of the cases, you don't make use of that data. You just look at the picture yeah, and present it. But in 99% of the cases, you do not do an analysis of the orientations of the crystals and how this boundary uh, interacts with this boundary and so on and so on. So you should spend at least a month on every picture looking at the detail and then you will discover something new. Yeah. Of course, you may not have time to complete your PhD, but you will be excited by the information that you see. Okay, um, 
Now I'm going to introduce you to a concept which is completely imaginary. It, it doesn't exist, but we like to find patterns in data, and this is a way of doing that for arrangements of atoms. Okay. So when we talk about a lattice like this, a lattice is an array of points, uh, it, is, it doesn't exist, it's in our minds. Okay. Uh, we are not yet putting any atoms on this. But this is a two-dimensional lattice, it's a square lattice, we have a, uh, a set of points here, and we've drawn lines between the points. Um, I could have chosen a different shape here to represent the same set of points. For example, if I draw this array of points, I could choose an oblique cell to represent the same square array of points. Yeah. And there are reasons for doing that. But the main point I want to make is that we simply choose a square cell because it's convenient to us that the edges are of the same length, the angles are 90 degrees, so, and you know it does reflect the symmetry of the pattern. But there might be circumstances, which we'll come to much later, where we want to choose a different unit cell to represent the same points, array of points. And each one of these points can be the origin of this cell. They are exactly equivalent points. Okay. That's the meaning of a lattice point, that the environment of this point will be exactly the same as the environment of this point if I draw uh, many more cells around here. So these are the lattice parameters. There's an angle here which is 90 degrees and this is a two-dimensional uh, unit cell, square lattice. What does the P stand for? So I've said this is a square P lattice. Primitive. What does that mean? You're right. Sorry? Um, yeah, so you are right. You, you said one atom in the cell, but we haven't got to atoms yet, so it's one lattice point per cell. You can have more than one atom in the cell and it can still be primitive. Yeah, I'll show you later. Uh, but it means that you have just one lattice point per cell. But why are we saying one? Because we've got four over here. Why is there just one lattice point per cell? How can I say that's primitive? Any ideas? Exactly. Yeah. So if I, if I draw some more unit cells, you will have this point being shared by four cells. So only a quarter of that belongs to this. Okay? So if I add quarter, 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 I get one per cell. Uh, these are some alternatives where we've changed the length of the edge so that we have uh, rectangles. This is the primitive rectangular lattice. And this is a centered lattice, a unit cell. So we have a, a, a lattice point at half, half, in a, addition to a lattice point at zero, zero. Okay. So this, this, how many lattice points would this have per cell? Two. Okay. Quarter, 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 quarter plus one. So there's two there. And this is the hexagonal, the primitive hexagonal lattice. The, this is special in the sense that this angle here is 60 degrees and this one is 120 degrees. But I could actually generalize this and relax those angles from those values, in which case I could get something like this. And here the lattice parameter is also different. So this angle is now not, 60 not necessarily 60 degrees. Okay? So that's uh, an oblique lattice. Now, the interesting thing uh, is these are the only possible patterns you can get in two dimensions. 
there are no more than five. So if you were making wallpaper, yeah, you know what wallpaper is, right? You don't use it very often in Korea, but in, in Europe, you, instead of painting, you put patterns of paper on the wall with flowers or whatever you like. And in principle, there are only five different kinds of wallpapers you can buy. Because any other pattern that you draw will simply fall into one of these five arrangements. So how come you can buy many more than five different kinds of wallpapers? There is no other periodic pa pattern which will fit, which will create a pattern, a unit cell which is different from the five illustrated here. So why is it that we can buy hundreds of different kinds of wallpapers? The, the motif, the atom, that we put at each lattice point can be different. It could be a flower or a bee or a cluster of flowers, etc. Okay? But the basic pattern will be one of five different kinds. Okay? Of course, uh, you could have random as well, but a random pattern is very much more difficult to print when you are producing you know, lots and lots of wallpapers. So probably you would pay an enormous amount if you ask them to produce you a random wallpaper pattern. <coughs> now this is a, a carbon nanotube. Uh, ba basically it's a, it's a sheet of uh, graphene which has a hexagonal array of uh, carbon atoms and it's wrapped up into a tube and there might be some objects, uh, some closing of the ends as well. But you, ca you can get two-dimensional crystals. You know, graphene, uh, a single layer of graphene is like a two-dimensional crystal. So this is our wallpaper. And um, it has a certain structure. There, there, there are these objects which are placed at each lattice point. And if you look carefully, you can see that that is the unit cell. Okay? So the environment here is exactly the same as the environment here and here and here. Yeah, can you see that? Now if I repeat this, then I can generate, whoops, I can, uh, let me go back. I can generate the entire wallpaper. All right? Now, what kind of a cell is this? Is this a primitive cell or not? Yeah. Yeah. You see that? Is, is, the, is the environment of this point exactly the same as the environment of this and this? That means you have a lattice point here, and it's a centered rectangular cell. OK? Uh, and if I repeat this cell, I can generate the whole pattern. How about these? Uh, which, ones, uh, which, which of these patterns are unit cells? Is this a, a unit cell? Yeah, this illustrates the fact that we can have the same array of points represented by different unit cells. So previously we had a rectangular centered cell. This is now an oblique cell. But is that a unit cell? Can I, can I put several of those and generate the whole pattern? Yeah. How about this one? No, because if I, if I take another triangle here, then I'm left with a hole, right? So a unit cell must be able to fill the space. 
if, if you stack it and it doesn't fill the space, then it's not a unit cell. Similarly, this is not a unit cell. And you could argue that if I take one of these and one of these, then that fills space, but that's not, uh, that's not the definition of a unit cell. You are using two different cells. There is a material like that, yeah. which has two different unit cells stacked together. About two years ago, there was a Nobel Prize given for a discovery which was made about 20 or 30 years ago. Quasi-crystals, weird. So that involves, you know, uh, if you take one, one pattern and you stack it, it won't fill space. But if you take two different patterns, you can tessellate them to fill all space, okay? And then, then you also get uh, interesting properties which we'll come to later. So the definition of a unit cell is that it must be able to fill all space. And we need to go a little bit further. Uh, these cell edges uh, not only have magnitudes, which we call the lattice parameters, but they also have directions. So they're effectively, they are vectors. Okay? And this is, uh, A1 is called a basis vector, and A2 is also called a basis vector. And uh, when we stack them together, we produce a repeating pattern. If we extend uh, what we've done so far into three dimensions, uh, we have the same, exactly the same principles. We are still working with imaginary points and therefore we can define cells uh, which are different but represent the same set of lattice points. But we obviously have an additional axis, A1, A2 and A3. So three lattice parameters and three angles and three basis vectors. Okay. So the concepts are exactly the same as the two-dimensional lattice, but we will have a greater possibility of the number of patterns. Instead of five, we have 14 possible patterns in three dimensions. So just to summarize, uh, each lattice point on your cell must have exactly the same environment around it. That's the fundamental definition of a lattice point. And that's why when you think about a dislocation, which causes slip deformation, the Burgers vector must be a lattice vector. That means it starts at a lattice point and ends at a lattice point. Because when you translate one half of the crystal relative to the other, by a lattice vector, there's no change in structure. And slip doesn't cause a change in structure, right? Uh, unit cell must fill space when you stack the cells. And you define the cell by the basis vectors A1, A2, and A3, which have magnitudes uh, A1, A2, and A3, and the angles between the axes are labeled conventionally as alpha, beta, and gamma. And in three dimensions, there are 14 possible different unit cells. Okay, so we now uh, come uh, to how we index directions, planes, etc. Okay. Now, in the case of directions, uh, let's say we are thinking about a vector u. We can write that vector as the sum of the weighted sum of the basis vectors, like u1, a1, plus u2, a2, plus u3, a3. So, this forms our coordinate system, and you define the vector in terms of that coordinate system. And these components, you write using square brackets, and those are the Miller indices of the direction. Okay. So Miller was a, a geologist in Cambridge University, actually, in the Earth Sciences Department. Uh, the Miller indices are named after, after him. So uh, here, I'm, this vector u is obtained by translating one along here and one along here, and therefore, the Miller indices are 1, 1. How about this one? Let's say it's going half along here. Okay. What would you label this as? The vector u? Yes, that's very good. 
So you already know crystallography because if you had asked me, I would have said it's one half. Yeah? Because it's going one along here and half along here. So why, why have you chosen to call it 2, 1? Because we like integers, right? Yeah? So, so this vector is actually exactly one and half. But its direction is parallel to 2, 1. So you label it as 2, 1. But if you wanted to be accurate, say, say you were uh, looking at the Burgers vector of a dislocation, then 2, 1 would not be correct. Yeah? You could write it in different ways. So it would be 1 and half, okay? or that is parallel to 2, 1. But this is equivalent to a upon 2 into 2, 1, okay? Assuming that it's a square lattice. Yeah. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're just referring to a general direction, then you call it 2, 1. But if you need to be careful about the magnitude of the vector, then you can write it like this and still maintain the integers inside the square brackets. Okay, so I'm specifically using square brackets for directions. Okay? Everyone happy with that? How about this? Uh, what would you call this direction? What are the Miller indices of this direction? Yeah? Minus 1, 1. Minus 1 and 1. And instead of writing minus 1, 1, you write bar 1, 1. Okay? And the second one, what are the Miller indices? Two one. So this genuinely is going two along A one and one along A two. Okay. So directions are fairly easy to index. And in three dimensions, what would you call this vector? One one one. And this one? Yeah, because it doesn't have any uh, any component along A one, so that's zero, one and one. Okay, now we have a, a small problem which comes from symmetry. So assume that this is a, a primitive cubic unit cell. Okay, that means all the edges are of equal length and all the angles alpha, beta, and gamma are at 90 degrees. Then this direction is 1, 0, 0 because you're going 1 along A1 and 0 along that and that. But I could have chosen my origin differently and call this the x-axis, in which case this would be 1, 0, 0, or this one. Okay. So the arrangement of atoms along this direction is exactly the same as along this direction or this direction. And whether we call that 1, 0, 0 or 0, 0, 1 depends on our choice of axes, right? So it's, it's arbitrary. So all of these directions are said to be crystallographically equivalent properties along those directions are precisely identical and what you index them as depends on your choice of origin. Okay. So in order to identify crystallographically uh, equivalent directions, instead of writing six of these, uh, you use brackets like this, the braces. Okay. So that tells me that you're referring to a direction which could be parallel to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, bar 1, 0, 0, and so on. Yeah. Okay, we now come to planes. Um, in order to find the indices of a plane, we have here uh, our plane and it intersects here uh, A1 at 1, 
intersects A2 at 1 and intersects A3 at a half, right? We then take the reciprocal of those intercepts and that gives us the Miller indices of that plane and we use round brackets for those Miller indices. Now, why do we do this? Uh, we will learn that uh, more clearly when we come to the reciprocal lattice, okay, which is a few lectures away. But basically, you know, the directions are vectors in real space. Yeah, so you just add up the components along the basis vectors and you get the indices of a direction. Plane normals, which is how you define a plane, are vectors in reciprocal space. And that is why the indices are defined by taking intercepts and then the reciprocals of those, inter uh, of those intercepts. So we'll come to that later on in, in the course. And we use round brackets for specific planes. Okay. Everyone happy with that? What are the indices of this plane? One on one, very good. Okay, so the intercepts along these axes are one one one, and therefore the reciprocal of that is also one on one, and we use square brackets to identify that specific plane. How about this one? Sorry? Zero one zero. What are the intercepts? Yeah, infinity, one, infinity, and if you take the reciprocal of that, it's zero, one, zero. There. Okay? Right, uh, this one. Zero, one, one, that's right. Okay? Right, and then we have the same problem that if our material is cubic, we have four of these closed back planes and their negatives. So there's a multiplicity of eight. And we really want to refer to just a closed back plane and say the indices, uh, you know, we are referring to the set of closed back planes which are crystallographically equivalent by using these curly brackets. Right? So square brackets refer to a specific plane and curly brackets like this refer to crystallographically equivalent set of planes. Okay, now, uh, I said to you that this course uh, will deal completely generally with crystals, not just metals. We might deal with a crystal which has 56 atoms. Yeah, so do you know an example uh, of a crystal with a large number of atoms inside the unit cell? It actually happens in steels. Cementite, yeah. 56 atoms in the cell. So, Although it's very easy to draw this diagram here, which is body-centered cubic, uh, it's no longer easy when you have a very complicated crystal structure. So my recommendation is you don't draw three-dimensional diagrams. They're not terribly useful as soon as you get away from the simplest of structures because you need to rotate, look along different directions, and even then it can be confusing because of overlap. Yeah? This is called a structure projection. Uh, we are projecting along the z-axis here, and this lattice point is located at a height half, 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 right? We don't put the x and y coordinates because they are already apparent on the diagram, but we put the z-coordinate. And when we don't put coordinates, that means there's a lattice point at 0 and at 1. Okay, so 0 and 1. So this is called a structure projection, and it's much, much easier to visualize than looking at something which is three-dimensional. So this is now a little bit more complicated. This is the face-centered cubic unit cell, where we have a lattice point at each corner and a lattice point at the center of each face. On the structure projection, it becomes very simple to look at. 
these are all at heights 0 and 1. So this is the face centering lattice point on the, on the face parallel to the bottom. Okay? You can see 0 and 1. These are located at coordinates half and half upwards. For example, this point here. And these are the face centers of the vertical faces. So this is the structure projection of the face-centered cubic cell. Uh, we also have a primitive cubic cell. Okay? And uh, the, the, there are very, very, uh, in fact, I know of only one metallic material which has the primitive cubic cell. It's, it's polonium. Okay? Or it's not really a st very stable structure otherwise. So most metals are either body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, hexagonal, okay? and then you might get some with uh, much lower symmetry. So these are the structure projections of the primitive, the body-centered, and the face-centered cell. So just as for primitive, we write the symbol P. For body-centered, we have the symbol I, because in Ger it's a German word for body-centered, which begins with I. Okay. And F is for face-centered cubic cell. So there are three, three varieties of unit cells for the cubic class of crystals. We, we also need to think about symmetry. We've already talked about that by identifying crystallographically equivalent planes and crystallographic equivalent directions. So in the cubic system, you know, we had six cell edges, which, have all, which all have exactly the same properties. Uh, if I change that to tetragonal, then the A axes are identical in the basal plane, but the C axis is different. So the symmetry changes, and now I have four equivalent 1, 0, 0 directions, not six. Okay? and so on. Um, this is a mirror plane, so if I put an object like this, I will see another object at that location. Uh, this is a, a four-fold rotation axis. That means if I rotate by 90 degrees, then I will find an object like this at that location, and here, and here. So a four-fold rotation axis is called a tetrad. I will come to that in more detail later. And of course, uh, the very definition of a crystal requires translational symmetry because the environment at every lattice point is exactly identical. Okay? So you can put your origin at any lattice point. So these are the basic elements of uh, symmetry, rotation axes, mirror planes, and translational symmetry. There is a, a, another uh, aspect which is a little bit more difficult to visualize. Uh, we will look at a two-dimensional visualization of this when we do stereograms. But basically what it means is that if I take this point and I invert it through the center, I find another equivalent point on the other side. Okay? So there is an inversion symmetry in this. Now why is this uh, important? If you don't have inversion symmetry, then the crystal acquires properties which are unusual. So um, if I stress the crystal, then I might displace charges in an unequal way. And therefore, I will get the crystal charging up, and you might get a spark. Yeah. So that's uh, ferroelectricity. So you know your lighters. Uh, in the old days, the lighters had uh, a flint stone, which is a stone which you do that, uh, which you strike, and you get a spark. But nowadays, it has a piezoelectric crystal, uh, which when you hit, will produce a spark. And that's the same in gas cookers. Yeah. You hear the click, click, click sound, that sparks coming out when you strike a piezoelectric crystal. So those, those will not have this uh, center of symmetry. Okay. okay. Uh, when crystallography first started, it was by looking at the beautiful shapes of crystals which you find in nature. Those crystals have had thousands and thousands of years to grow. And therefore, they are close to the equilibrium shape of crystals. 
So just by looking at the symmetry of that shape, you could tell whether it's cubic or whether it's uh, tetragonal or monoclinic or triclinic or whatever. That's how crystallography happened until diffraction and the Bragg law uh, were discovered or, or invented around the uh, early part of the 20th century. Before then, crystallography was by measuring the angles between faces of crystals. Very careful work. Yeah? Now, when you do that, when you measure macroscopic properties, you cannot, of course, co make comments about uh, the details of very small, uh, very small um, translations inside the crystal. Okay? So, for example, this is called a glide plane. This is a mirror plane. If I take this object and I reflect it, the, then I get this object here. Okay? So if I have these two objects in my crystal, I know there's a mirror plane here. Yeah? There is another kind of a plane, which is called a glide plane. So if I take this and I reflect it along here and then translate it by a fraction of a lattice parameter, say half a lattice parameter, then I recover this object here. There's nothing left here. So this is a reflection plus a translation by a fraction of the lattice parameter. That's called a glide plane. Now, when you look at the macroscopic shape, this appears like a mirror plane, simply because you can't pick up that half a cell edge translation. Okay? Uh, but when you look at the details of the structure, you find the glide plane. Okay? But you need a resolution on the atomic level. Uh, this is like a rotation axis, but in addition to rotation, there, uh, there's a translation. So exactly like a screw. Yeah, when you turn the screw, it also moves, doesn't it? So here, I, um, this is a diode. That means 180 degree rotation. If I rotate it along here by 180 degrees, I have a shape like this and translate it by a fraction of the repeat distance and I recover this. Okay? So this is a screw axis. And when you look at the macroscopic shape of the crystal, that will appear just like a rotation axis. You don't pick up that very, very small translation. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, a screw and a glide? Yeah. So in this case, uh, let's look at the screw first. So this is the screw axis, and this is the repeat distance. Okay. Uh, that means this is I could start here or I could start here. Okay. Now when I rotate by 180 degrees, it produces this. Yeah. And if I translate by uh, half uh, half of the repeat distance, then it produces this. So this is an axis of rotation, right? It's, it's a line. Okay. Now, a glide plane is a plane. And um, I should really um, draw it as something like this. Uh, it's a bit tricky to draw, okay? But I'll draw black on this side of the plane and red on that side of the plane. Right? So if I have uh, this object here, then after reflecting, it becomes that object, yeah, which is on the other side of the plane. And uh, then I translate by a fraction. Yeah. So just reflection would give me, make this plane a mirror. So a plane, uh, you know, a plane might have other objects here, which have to behave in the same way. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So a plane is two-dimensional, whereas uh, an axis is one. Uh, the axis itself is, you know, one-dimensional. Okay. Right, so we have, um, we can define all 
crystals into seven different classes, right? Uh, and within each class, I have, for example, in the cubic, I have primitive, body-centered cubic, and face-centered cubic. So if I add up all the different varieties in these seven crystal classes, I get the 14 different unit cells possible in three dimensions. Okay. And uh, the cell is defined by the basis vectors. In the case of cubic, they're all identical in, uh, in uh, magnitude, and the angles are all 90 degrees. This is quite important, right? So if something, uh, a triad is a rotation of 180 degrees, a rotation axis with 120 degrees. If you cannot find four such axes, it cannot be cubic, right? So do you know which direction the triad lies along in a cube? So along the body diagonal, right? And there are four body diagonals, which are the four triads. If you do not have four triads, it cannot be cubic. So we call this the defining symmetry of the cubic class of crystals. If I can only find one triad, that cannot be cubic. Okay? That, that is, in fact, a trigonal crystal system. Uh, in order to have a hexagonal, uh, system, uh, hexagonal unit cell, I must have one hexad, you know, with a rotation of um, 60 degrees, reproducing everything. Yeah. So when you look at the shape of a large crystal, and you can see, f uh, you can see along the body diagonals of that crystal and see that there are four tetrads, four triads, you know that it's cubic. You don't have to do any diffraction experiment. And similarly, if you can find a hex, uh, hexad, then it has to be the, in the hexagonal class. It cannot be in any of the others because none of the others have a six-fold rotation axis. So just by looking, uh, all these crystal classes were derived not by diffraction, but by looking at the shapes of macroscopic crystals. Just came back uh, last week from Russia where I was visiting a minerals university and I took hundreds of photographs of minerals which are on my website and you can see the shapes of these very large crystals which have grown in nature over very long periods of time just by looking at those the crystallographers derived the 14 Brave lattices and the crystal classes and so on with no, no reference to diffraction theory Okay, so these are our 14 uh, crystal classes. We have uh, cubic P, F, and I. Uh, then we have uh, lower symmetries. And you've got the orthorhombic system where the three edges are all different in length, but the angles are all 90 degrees. And the lowest symmetry is the triclinic cell, okay, where none of the edges are equal and none of the angles are uh, equal either. And this is a much simpler way of looking at those 14 as structure projections rather than the three-dimensional cells. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so um, I've taught you enough for you to complete quiz one. Okay? Uh, and please do that because you will be able to see what you don't understand. Uh, because, you know, sitting in a lecture, uh, I'm telling you what is right and what is wrong, but you cannot test yourself until you actually try the quiz. Yeah? So the purpose of the quiz is not simply to give you a mark at the end of the course, but so that you follow the lectures as we progress. And the second lecture, then, is not more difficult than the first lecture. Okay? Okay, so we will stop here today and see you tomorrow.